gorgeous, gorgeous day. Um, I am in Hell when Kelly asked me uh, that different because at the last minute I couldn't come. Um, uh, the panel which, which would address the convergence of international humanitarian law, criminal law, and human rights law. Um, I immediately thought back uh, to my time when I was at the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia. My name is Trad. Um, and, and in those days, the very idea of imagining that there would be such convergence of these different strands of law seemed unimaginable, very distant indeed. At the tribunal, we had specialists in humanitarian law, uh, that is, especially military people. Um, we had specialists in human rights law, and the military people, of course, were, were very proud of um, the law that they knew and were expert in uh, deriving, as it did uh, primarily, from codes. Uh, where they had very clear uh, definitions and expectations uh, of what the law was to comply. Um, the human rights uh, experts um, at the tribunal, who um, uh, seem to, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the argument certainly to, um, uh, particularly the arguments with the humanitarian lawyers. Um, that it was clear their sort of law was to be probably colloquial, uh, a bit more mush, um, um, and um, often the source of disagreement as we're trying to come down to define uh, exactly, for example, exactly what it was we were going to have to prove as we were considering charging a particular crime. Uh, but very clear that their sources of law were obviously very different. Uh, from the sources that the humanitarian would want and their methods of reasoning about it seemed different. And then there were most of the rest of us, uh, the criminal lawyers. Uh, most of them uh, not international criminal lawyers because it, it, that wasn't so clear what that meant. Uh, what we were were criminal practitioners uh, from various uh, jurisdictions. Uh, to tell you that we had to learn to talk to each other and to understand each other's legal reasoning uh, is obvious. Um, uh, we did learn to talk to each other, um, uh, but uh, of course you, you didn't come here um, on this gorgeous afternoon to hear me talk about the stories from the Yugoslav Tribunal, much as I love to tell them. Um, uh, but I do want to remind you, as you hear the different perspectives and views of people on this wonderful panel, um, that in the end, uh, two things. Uh, questions of convergence of these different <coughs> traditional bodies of law, in the end, have to come down to practical application in any of the different <coughs> kinds of fora that we've been talking about through this weekend. Um, practitioners have to apply this law in um, And secondly, to remind you how new it is even to ask this question, is there a convenience among these traditionally very separate bodies of law? Um, the panel is, is, as I said, extraordinary. We'll begin with our beloved Ben Ferenz, who, is, as I'm sure all of you know, is a former prosecutor at Nuremberg and a tireless advocate for international criminal justice. Uh, we have Michael Scharf, who's a professor at the New England School of Law, uh, who was formerly uh, uh, at the United States Department of State, uh, and he has written extensively uh, about uh, the ad hoc tribunals, about the ICC, and about related issues. Um, uh, we have uh, Diane Pokemner, who is the extraordinarily uh, articulate advocate for human rights. She is uh, uh, assistant deputy general counsel at Human Rights Watch. Um, and we have Peggy Hicks, who's from the International Human Rights Law Group. Uh, with uh, extensive experience in, in the field and experience with exactly these issues. 
Um, and Diane Warnberger, who's a professor at, um, of law at American University, um, who has also written extensively about international criminal justice issues. So you have a treat in store for you. And let's begin with Ben Ferenc. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Uh, as you already noticed, I'm kind of an expert at dismembering furniture. And uh, the reason I've done that is I hope that I can see the people that I'm speaking to, because you can't see me, but if I've been behind that podium, you would only heard my voice. Anyway, um, I'm rather a wild card in this and other audiences. My instructions are, looking at the program, to deal with the international law in the 21st century, United Nations and other international entities, that is the next century. Now, I must admit I'm better off at predicting the past than the future, even though it looks like I've been here for the entire century. Uh, the second part of the discussion here deals with the convergence and overlap of international humanitarian laws that have been explained to you by Strack. Uh, international humanitarian law, international criminal law, international human rights law. Um, that all sounds very profound, very confusing. And I'm even more confused by the fact that I have these three charming ladies who have suddenly appeared on the panel. Uh, I'm delighted that they're here. Uh, these were already scheduled. At least uh, uh, Michael Sharp was not. You've heard him here in some of the other panels. So you're, all of us are in for a surprise because we have a level playing field. You have no idea what I'm going to talk about, neither do I. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> judging by what I see here, whatever it is, I've got to cut it short. Uh, because uh, Kelly Aspen told me to go half an hour to fill in the time that some of the people didn't show up, but she has so many good friends here that they all jumped in. Anyway, what I'll try to do, in line with what uh, Minister Rack has suggested, is to give you an overview of the past century, because the past is prologue, and see what lessons it gives us. And if I deal with the topics that have been listed in the program, uh, let me take three foundation stones for our approach to human rights and the convergence of principles. Let's begin first with the United Nations, the United Nations Charter. Go on with that with the next foundation stone, put down at about the same time, the Nuremberg Tribunals, and then we can deal with the uh, International Declaration Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as we look at those, let us see what were the goals, what were the aspirations behind these three big movements in the last century. To what extent have those goals been realized? To what extent have they not been realized? What can we do? What is required in order to achieve those goals? and what you can do to move in the directions which I hope you'll want to move in, and that is toward the convergence of all of the human rights into one regime. Here we also have the very interesting acoustics that you may have difficulty hearing me, but I hear myself twice. <laughs> uh, I hope this will be a little better for you, and uh, I have my coach in the back, my wife who's sitting in the back row there, and she says, now this is okay. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, begin with the United Nations, or what prompted it. All of these movements are an outgrowth of war. The first human rights discussions took place, go back to Solferino, the International Red Cross at that time, the Red Cross, began to talk about rules, and in the American Civil War, Abe Lincoln called upon Francis Lieber, a Prussian army officer who happened to be teaching at Columbia University, and they drew up the code which the United States Army still follows for the governance of the behavior of armies in the field to try to create certain humanitarian bases for the behavior of people when they're busy trying to kill each other. And the big conference, of course, was in The Hague in 1899. And uh, at that time, they called it the first peace conference. Well, like most diplomatic conferences, it was rather a misnomer. Uh, diplomats from, I think it was 38 self-styled civilized nations came together in the Hague, and they set the pattern, which is followed to this very day. 
But what happens when diplomats get together? They make flowery speeches, they print a lot of documents, they circulate everything, they walk around in the woods. And when they get all through, the peace conference, of course, didn't create peace. They were about to go to war. But it did agree upon a number of rules on how to go about killing yourself in a more humane way. And some of those rules from the Hague Conventions, 1907, was the next one. They expected one in two years, but they were already at war. And the protocols which have come in the meanwhile, that gives us also a basis of that. My own involvement is I happen to be a soldier in the Second World War, not the First World War. Um, and uh, after spending three years of my life with General Patton, who also came along, uh, I jumped into the sea at Normandy Beach and fought through every campaign and crossed the Rhine and Remagen and was in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, as we got to the end, uh, as we entered Germany and began to run into the atrocities, my assignment as an enlisted man of sergeant of infantry was to go into the concentration camps and uh, try to seize the criminals or the evidence of the crimes in order that we would be able to have uh, war crimes trials. I won't delay the evening by describing what I have seen. You've all seen the films of the atrocities. They don't begin to convey the horrors of war uh, and what it means. And when that was over, the United Nations was formed as a follow-up of the League of Nations which had failed. And it was again the hope of all the wise men that we would create a society in which all human beings could live in peace and human dignity. That was the goal. After the First World War, with only 20 million people killed, dying in the trenches and gas and all the rest of it, uh, the League of Nations came together. It was really the first international peace effort. And they drew up the covenant of the League. In case you don't know who I am, I'm going to rest. The covenant of the League had some very interesting provisions. It called for disarmament. It called for sanctions against the aggressor in order to put an end to war in future. The idea was a simple one. Some country commits aggression against the League, they will all cease all connections with them. All economic trade, military communications, everything that would bring the aggressor down. That was the idea. But they didn't quite agree on who the aggressor was and how to define aggression, and they all had to have a unanimous vote on it, by consensus, they call it now, which meant that everybody had a veto, which meant that in practice, when it got down to the problem of stopping Italy, for example, which had a clear case of aggression against Ethiopia, and Haile Selassie came before the League of Nations and said, what shall I tell my people? Italy is committing clear aggression against another member of the League what will you do? And the French and the British got together and said, well, if we stop sending oil to Italy for its tanks, the Italians will get very angry with us and they may join the Germans. If they join the Germans, we've got an alliance there which we don't want. And why, why should we risk our people for those people in Italy and Ethiopia who are killing themselves? Let them kill themselves. And so in clear disregard of their obligations under the covenant of the League, they failed to implement the provisions. And the rest of it, as you know, is history. It didn't take much longer, and there we were in World War II. Well, after I had won that war, uh, <laughs> I settled down uh, and listened to what the United Nations was saying. I always carry with me two documents. One is the Charter of the United Nations, the other Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And for those of you, some young people I'm glad to see here, everybody looks young to me, um, I want to remind you, it says, we the peoples, in order to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, and it goes on and it outlines all of these beautiful principles. And a lot of them are inconsistent. They want to have peace, they want to have disarmament, they want to have an international military force, uh, they talk about social justice, uh, they talk about self-determination, the right of all peoples, 
how exactly you're going to achieve that isn't made exactly clear. Because it was too difficult. Now let me refer briefly to something which gets everybody excited without really understanding what's behind it. When they came to set up this new world organization, theoretically designed as far as it could go to maintain the peace, they came out with a document which contained noble phrases, many contradictory, inconsistent with each other, and an organization which had no independent financing authority, it had no military force, it had no legislative power, it was totally dependent upon support from its members. Now, that's no way to set up a world. But to make matters even worse, they had a provision in there that those who were most likely to threaten the peace, the five permanent members, they had all and each and every one of them a veto right against any enforcement action. So you couldn't do anything to enforce a rule of law unless all five of those parties agreed. Now you might ask yourself as organized, how could they come up with such a stupid document? And the answer is, that's the best they could do. It was better than the covenant of belief. The covenant, everybody had a veto, and nothing worked. Uh, the sanctions committee, the economic weapon didn't work because there were all kinds of disagreements. They said, who's going to suffer the consequences? If we're exporting, we're making money, the other people are dependent upon it, we can't do that, everybody's going to be hurt. So it was a significant step forward by the United States in the lead. This document was written in the State Department of the United States. They then carried it off to Dunbar's Oaks, which is right out in Washington. And then they went to uh, San Francisco and had the other nations sign it with some minor modifications. But this was written by the United States, which I'm proud to say was the moving party. But what fell down was the International Covenant of Human Rights. <laughs> I think it fell down before I dropped it. Um, there, the veto power, which causes so much concern, should be explained because it relates to the convergence problem of how these things come together. President Roosevelt was very much aware of what happened to President Wilson. Wilson was a great hero. He had brought victory after the First World War. But in order for the United States to become a member of the League, he had to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, which required, under our Constitution, approval by two-thirds of the Senate. He had the majority, but as you heard at the luncheon, if you were there today, uh, it's very difficult to get two-thirds of the Senate to agree to anything. And they sure were not going to agree to a new international organization which is going to have the power to send American boys, and I was one of the boys, back to war without the consent of the United States. The Russians couldn't care less about such an organization, and the British were prepared to shoot these Germans uh, without any trial of any kind. So in order to get the United States on board, it was necessary to write in a veto power to satisfy those in the United States who were then, and similar as there are today, people against any involvement in international affairs uh, by the United States. So it came in as a compromise, as a necessary compromise. And there were some people who met in this room. Uh, Clark and Soane, you've read the book. Uh, Mr. Clark, his picture is somewhere around here, wrote to his friend uh, Roosevelt and he said, look, this is not going to work. You need the consent of all the five powers. And you assume they're all going to agree. If they don't agree, this is not going to work. Roosevelt said, I know that. But what are our options? We have no choice. But as a compromise, they said, we'll write a provision and there's going to be a review of the charter. No later than five years, ten years, they were going to review it and try to make the adjustment at that time. Of course, there have been no such review. So, despite the fact that the Charter was really a defective instrument in terms of uh, creating a rational system of man management of this planet, it continued with the same provisions, which gave rise to all kinds of problems. So you have there the hope of the nations after the war, 
created in this instrument, and by virtue of the political compromises that were necessary, it was an instrument which was known to be inadequate and remains inadequate to this day. The next step was a very important step in which I was involved. That was the Nuremberg Trials. When I say Nuremberg now, I mean the Tokyo Trials and all subsequent trials thereafter. There were 12 trials after the International Military Tribunal. I was the chief prosecutor in one of those trials. The chief of counsel for the International Military Tribunal was Justice Robert Jackson. For the 12 subsequent trials, it was General Telford Taylor, who was uh, my law partner for many years, who died a few years ago. The purpose of these trials was set forth in an instrument known as the Charter for the International Military Tribunal. It had three points in it. The least important was the one which related to the subject, the rules of war, which have been dealt with extensively here by Professor Meron and others. And as I've indicated, that goes back to the Battle of Solferino, goes back before that to the Bible, what you can do to your enemy, and the just war principles, and so on. There was nothing novel about that. The big contribution of Nuremberg was in two things. One, the most important of all, it was laid down that aggressive war, warfare itself, which had been a national right since biblical days, was declared to be an international crime. And it was declared that those who were responsible for war making would have to answer in a court of law for that crime. Because that crime, according to the judgment of the International Military Tribunal, was the supreme international crime. It gives rise to all the other crimes that occur in time of war. Always have, and I think always will. And uh, the objective of that tribunal was not to create ex post facto law, as is often alleged. These principles were being built up over the years. In fact, in the First World War, they tried to hold the Kaiser responsible for aggression against little Belgium and so on. Uh, and they didn't succeed because the jurists who were considering it said, look, uh, this would be ex post facto. No head of state has ever been convicted before of such a crime, uh, and we can't do it. We'll charge him with offenses against international morality and treaties on the Treaty of Versailles, but we can't charge them with aggressive war. And they didn't. But the jurists who were involved made a very specific point, and they said in future, in future, it will be different. And after World War I, there were a huge number of declarations, I mentioned only the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which outlawed the war as an instrument of national policy accepted by most nations of the world. I have gotten an order from the right, the right wing. The right wing says I've got five minutes more. Kelly Askin, from whom I took my marching instructions, said I had 30 minutes. So now I'm gonna to have to reach a compromise. And I will compromise, because that's life. You've gotta compromise. The point simply is that it was necessary to reach compromises in the charter. It was necessary to reach compromises at Nuremberg. We said aggressive war was a crime. We enunciated another doctrine that crimes against humanity would be punishable offenses. When the crimes rose to such a magnitude that it violated the conscience of humankind, the entire international community could step in and hold accountable those who were responsible for the crimes. These were great steps forward. And a very important point, which is often forgotten and overlooked, it was made explicitly clear in the judgments and the speeches of the prosecutors in all of the trials that the law we were laying down was to be a law in the, for the future which would bind everyone. To pass these defendants a poison chalice, said Justice Jackson, is to put it to our own lips as well. We were trying to lay down a law which would bind everyone. No one thought that we were going to lay down a law for the rest of the world, but not for us. Let me move on quickly now to what happened. It'll be very quick because you know what happened. The world that we sought to create of peace where all human beings could live in peace and dignity as prescribed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I can't go into anymore, uh, didn't materialize. On the contrary, the Cold War soon paralyzed action by the United Nations. 
and uh, nations declared their adherence to these documents. In principle, they agreed to practice they disregarded them. And the world went back to war and killing as usual, and worse than as usual, because they invented all kinds of new weapons. And whereas, dum-dum bullets, soft lead bullets, which make a big hole in your body if they hit a bone, was outlawed as illegal after the First World War, and remains outlawed today as a war crime, nuclear weapons are not. That is crazy. That is crazy. The emperor is not only stark naked, he's stark raving mad. That's the kind of a world they have given you. <clears throat> Why did that happen? Because people are unwilling to change their way of thinking. They cling to their old hatreds, would rather give up their life than their hatreds. They cling to old dogmas. What does it take to make a change? You have to change their way of thinking on very fundamental things. You have to create new institutions. We are in the process of creating them. There are human rights courts in Strasbourg, and we're talking about an international criminal court now. And it's a wonderful thing, because we're beginning to think rationally of this. But those who have the power don't want to give it up, and those who don't have the power don't have the power to bring about a change. So they keep pushing. And they keep pushing, and slowly, 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 we make progress. And the progress has been fantastic, if you want to consider it in a broader horizon and a time perspective. I look at it, I've been doing this now, I'm over 80 years of age, my wife and I combined, we're sitting there, we are 160, but that's a combination, I don't mention that. Uh, and uh, I've seen these changes. The world is beginning to awaken to a human conscience. We are beginning to have the feeling that this is really one planet, and it has to, got to be managed in a rational way. Global problems require global solutions, and today everything is global. You get up in the morning, I go to my computer, the first thing, I got 50 emails waiting for me. I can send out 100 messages immediately all over the world. I push the button, I see what's television, what's happening in China. Uh, this world has changed. It's a very radical change. And it's wonderful, it's very exciting. I wish I had, I was uh, 50 years younger, maybe 70 years younger. <laughs> Start all over again. Uh, because the world is awakening to the need to think globally and to think in a more humane way. And it doesn't matter whether you call it international humanitarian law, whether you call it international criminal law. All of this is coming together in the awareness, particularly on the part of non-governmental organizations and those who are not tied down into the system with which we were all raised. The system which thinks it's got to be our way and no other way. You can't do that. Just as I've compromised by cutting my speech down to half, so <laughs> others here will have to compromise if we're going to have a peaceful world. But I'm sure that it can be done. So I just want to end with a word of encouragement. I have seen these changes. I know how difficult it is. I know how much suffering there is in the world today. I'm very keenly aware of that. I feel it very deeply. <coughs> the only way to deal with it is to try to change it. Uh, if you try to change it, it will change. And it has been changing. And if you try and you don't see the changes, try harder. Uh, and I'm sure that if you do that, you'll continue to see this remarkable progress that you've made in converging all of these symbols as we move toward a universal declaration of human rights where all human beings may live in peace and dignity, which I think is their entitlement and should be your goal. Thank you. Following the hardest act in our profession, so Bob. Um, and I should tell you that just before we came in, Ben who I've known for years and years, confided to me for the first time ever that he was a child actor. And now I know where all this dramatic ability comes from. Um, and he also suggested that a lot of professors in general need more of that spark, especially at the end of the day, to keep people awake. So I'm going to stand up to keep myself awake and hope to keep you awake as well. And I'm going to continue the discussion of the convergence of international humanitarian law and international criminal law and human rights law. I should mention, that when Kelly asked me to step in at the last minute, 
I called home because I had promised my son, who I hadn't seen for a couple years, or a couple days, he's five, <laughs> he's five years old, I promised him I'd make it home before his bedtime. He said, Daddy, don't miss your flight. So I said, Kelly, you think I can go early on and then sneak out? She said, okay, so don't think I'm being rude to the other panelists, but after my remarks, or even in the middle of them, I may sneak out. Um, the theme of my remarks, is going to be a little bit different, and I'm going to try to be a bit provocative, and unfortunately I won't be here to hear your responses to my provocations, so maybe that's a good thing. Um, but it's that while a little convergence in this area is a good thing, too much convergence can be a little dangerous. And I should begin by mentioning that I teach separate courses in all three areas of the law that we're talking about here. The laws of war, international criminal law, and human rights law. And every year, there's more overlap in my courses, in the content, in my syllabuses. And so I'm endeavoring to keep each course unique, but it's impossible to do. And this reflects the convergence that's occurring out in the real world. I'm also the co-author of the only current US casebook on international criminal law that just came out in its second edition. And what we've done is added more and more materials to our international criminal law book on the laws of war and on human rights law because these are now being considered as part and parcel of international criminal law. The trend of bringing these three areas of law together are being propelled very strongly by the jurisprudence and the creation of the ad hoc tribunals and the new international criminal court. For instance, the ad hoc tribunal's jurisdiction is supposed to be confined to international humanitarian law. But the Security Council, in drafting those statutes and approving them and the resolutions, specifically said that they would include genocide, which never before had been thought of as the laws of war, and also crimes against humanity, including torture, which had historically been considered part of human rights law. In addition, the general part of the tribunals and the ICC statute are based on the principles of international criminal law that had never before been applied to war crimes trials. Nuremberg, with all the greatness that it served as the precedent, was an imperfect experiment, which has now been closer to perfected by these new tribunals by including international human rights law and international criminal law principles. For instance, they spell out the theories of accomplice liability, the defenses that are allowed, such as duress, necessity, immaturity, insanity, and intoxication, if not in the statutes, at least in the rules of procedure, and the rights of the defense that are codified in the ad hoc tribunals, statutes, and rules are based on the principles of human rights law that come from Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Such rights as to be informed of the charges, to counsel to a speedy trial against self-incrimination, to be present at your trial, to cross-examine your accusers, and against double jeopardy, were not recognized at Nuremberg. Those are human rights rights that are now part of the war crimes tribunals. And the criticism of the ad hoc tribunals has been great when they have departed from human rights standards. For instance, when Judge McDonald justify the use of anonymous witnesses in the Tadich case, there was an outcry. Well, she said, first of all, Nuremberg didn't use, uh, Nuremberg didn't have the right of confrontation. You were allowed to have anonymous witnesses and ex parte affidavits. She pointed out that war crimes tribunals historically were different from other trials. And the international community said, no, we believe that the human rights standards of today need to be applied even to war crimes tribunals. You see the convergence. Now, to my theme, the possibility that there is too much convergence. And I'm going to use just one example, but there's probably many others. And that is the example of applying war crimes law and principles to terrorism. This principle, or this proposal, this concept, is currently being debated at the United Nations. Because for years, the UN has been considering creating a generic definition of terrorism to differentiate the terrorist from the freedom fighter. And the proposal that is now on the table is that we should define terrorism as, quote, the peacetime equivalent of war crimes. The benefits of this proposal is that you would 
borrow the detailed definitions and extensive jurisprudence of war crimes and apply them to terrorism law, which is much less developed. You would also fill gaps in the current anti-terrorism treaty regime. So, for instance, you could outlaw, through this definition, attacks by any means against civilians. That would be a war crime if it was during wartime. It's therefore terrorism by this definition. Attacks by any means against civilian mass transit, such as trains and subways and buses. Attacks against uh, the water supply and other utilities. All of these things currently aren't covered, but this definition would allow them to be covered. You would also, for the first time, apply the concept of command responsibility to terrorist leaders. Everybody should know that in domestic criminal law and also in terrorism law, there is no concept of respondeat superior. If you're not adequate to accomplice liability, you don't have the war crimes principle of command responsibility. This would allow you to import that. And finally, you would render terrorists legitimate targets for deadly force, not just necessary or reasonable force, as many constitutions require their police actions to fit. There is actually a trend out there in this direction. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in a 1997 Argentina case, uh, since I just jotted down these notes without my materials the last minute, I can't remember the exact site, but you can look it up at the date. They held that a small group of civilians that used civilian weapons and tried to take over a military barracks during peacetime, in which there was fighting that ensued for 30 hours, was sufficient to constitute an armed <coughs> conflict to apply the laws of war. Now that is a very much lowering of the threshold requirement of armed conflicts in order to apply the laws of war to what is essentially a terrorist incident. And that's the trend you're seeing, at least in the Inter-American Commission context. Also in the United States, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals about 10 years ago in the Ata case said that the political offense exception to extradition should not apply to some terrorists who have committed the equivalent of war crimes by targeting civilians. They specifically cited in that opinion the Geneva Conventions by analogy. And finally, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, also about 10 years ago in the Yunus case, said that Fawaz Yunus, who had been part of a terrorist organization, could potentially use the obedience to orders defense if he could prove that he was part of a hierarchy, that he carried arms and that this group carried arms openly, and that they generally complied with the laws of war. In other words, some terrorists, although not Fawaz Yunus in that case, would then be allowed to use the obedience to orders defense. That sort of previews, previews the problems with the convergence. If you're going to apply the definitions and obligations of war crimes to the peacetime scenario of terrorism, then it just makes common sense that you couldn't bifurcate it. You would have to also apply the rights that go along with the laws of war. So for instance, in the laws of war, killing a combatant is the equivalent of justified homicide. It's not murder. Therefore, when the terrorist targets government personnel, as opposed to innocent civilians, they would become legitimate targets under this definition. Also under the laws of war, you have the collateral damage doctrine. This means that civilian deaths that were incidental to attack that was targeted at government personnel or a government facility would not be murdered they would be collateral damage, permissible under the laws of war. Further, the taking of combatant prisoners would be a legitimate act as opposed to kidnapping or hostage taking. Also, attacks on government buildings would be legitimate. They wouldn't be criminal. As I previewed, the obedience to orders defense could apply to terrorist organizations as long as they met certain criteria. And terrorists would suddenly be given POW status when they were arrested and the special rights the POWs get as opposed to common criminals. While this might be an incentive for terrorists to play by the rules of war, it's also going to make terrorism much more likely to occur. It goes against the policy of deglamorizing terrorism and it's going to give them all sorts of technical, technical loopholes to fight criminal prosecutions. In conclusion, 
There is no question that there is a trend in the congruence of these, in the convergence of these three areas of the law. But the terrorism example demonstrates the potential dangers of the trend of converging these three areas unless we carefully tread and focus on potential unintended, unintended consequences. Otherwise, the convergence is not necessarily a good thing, but potentially fraught with dangers. Thank you. Thank you. 
uh, while human rights standards require that lethal force be used only where necessary to pre prevent an imminent threat to life, the laws of war, as Michael's uh, 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 alluded to, uh, grant the combatant the privilege of shooting opposing combatants on sight. So, would it be tenable to characterize every stone-throwing teenager as a combatant? I don't think that the Israeli Defense Forces have taken that line, uh, it's a, but it's a, a, a very cogent issue. So our approach in this situation was to focus on the areas of rough congruence between the two bodies of law, which are considerable. On the use of force, we focused on collateral casualties to persons who were clearly not posing a genuine threat to Israeli forces or other civilians. Uh, those would be the, the rock throwing teenagers. Uh, and others, people who are genuine bystanders just caught up. There's a duty of protection towards such persons in both bodies of law. In human rights terms, respect for the right to life and bodily integrity underlies the United Nations basic principles on the use of force and firearms by law enforcement officials. And these would apply also to military personnel acting in policing capacity. Under these principles, resort to firearms may be had only when other means are insufficient to counter an imminent threat of death or serious injury, and shooting to kill only when strictly unavoidable in order to protect life. Uh, and then where it's unavoidable, the officers must exercise restraint in such use and act in proportion to the seriousness of the offense and the legitimate objective to be achieved. Doesn't that sound like humanitarian law? Very close. Um, and minimize damage and injury and respect and preserve human life. Now in humanitarian law, as all of you I'm sure are aware, the principle of civilian immunity requires civilians be protected against the danger arising from a military operation, that they not be made the object of direct attack or indiscriminate force, that is a, uh, an attack that would result in excessive harm to civilians in proportion to the direct and concrete military advantage. Uh, to that end, you have to employ all feasible precautions, such as ascertaining whether the object of attack is civilian in nature, the degree of incidental harm to civilians any attack may bring, and giving advance uh, warnings uh, to minimize casualties. Now, we analyzed three incidents, and in three uh, incidents, we found that Israeli forces were violating these principles, whether you state them in terms of uh, policing or combat. And they were violating them in a fairly ambiguous manner, using little tear gas, firing rubber bullets indiscriminately into crowds in circumstances where the forces did not face an imminent threat from the crowds. Uh, Palestinian Authority police also failed in their duty to prevent attacks by armed demonstrators that were endangering the crowd uh, and bystanders as well. Uh, in humanitarian terms, the gunmen that were using surrounding crowds as a human shield uh, would also have been using a forbidden tactic. We received credible accounts that both sides had deliberately fired upon ambulances, a plain violation of humanitarian law, but equally unjustified when considered from the perspective of the basic principles, which require officers to ensure that assistance and medical aid are rendered to the injured at the earliest possible moment. I think this example illustrates, uh, to some degree, the artificiality of the legal threshold of art conflict. Uh, the ICC commentary certainly urges the widest possible application of Article 3 on the basis that it represents universally recognized norms of civilized behavior. As the commentary states, what government would dare claim before the world that Article 3 not being applicable, it was entitled to leave the wounded uncared for, to torture and mutilate prisoners, and to take hostages? You could say exactly the same argument with regard to Protocol 2, whose uh, provisions are very basic. Um, and many of the other humanitarian norms I've alluded to derive from Protocol 1's elaboration of what constitutes humane uh, treatment for civilians, principles that are generally recognized as descriptive of customary international law. It's hoped that the ICRC's long-awaited report on customary international humanitarian law will further assist the effort to bridge this gap. I think we've gone long uh, past the misperception that human rights law suddenly vanishes when an armed conflict commences. This, I think, used to, to some degree, be an expert misperception, certainly a lay misperception. Um, there is sort of an interesting trend in the, a popular trend in the other direction. I, I urge you to take a look at the ICRC website, particularly the feature on people on the war. This is a uh, study that the ICRC commissioned using focus groups in countries that had experienced conflict. 
um, where they ask people how did they understand the Geneva Conventions, what did they see as violations of, uh, uh, not necessarily the rules for, but what were the, what were the wrongs committed in the conflict and how did they characterize them. Um, and, and a very interesting thing, very often they, they con uh, characterize what is standard features of humanitarian law as being human rights, basic human rights. For example, in the case of Israeli respondents, 89% had heard of the Geneva Conventions, but 27% of those people thought that they had something to do with human civil or civil rights. Um, another important development is that the Human Rights Committee has been discussing uh, and preparing a new comment on Article 4, uh, the article on derogability, which would re-examine the issue and give it, uh, I think, a more strict reading in light of the fundamental proscription uh, to ensure all rights without discrimination, that is, there is a prescription on derogations that are discriminatory. And this would be a very powerful approach given that the rights uh, are often derogated with respect only to disfavored groups. So, I, I summarize that these developments, along with the creation of the ICC statute and the jurisprudence of the uh, ad hoc tribunals, has slowed for the moment a movement to draft uh, what has been variously termed minimum standards of humanity or fundamental uh, standards of humanity. Uh, these are to be a core set of norms drawn from both bodies of law uh, that would apply to non-state as well as state actors in different times of both uh, conflict, on conflict, and other uh, uh, times. Um, this need, the, the perceived need for a new set of norms was based on, first of all, the non-applicability of human rights law to non-state actors, uh, the whole issue of derogability, which I think is more theoretical, very few states actually uh, do formal derogations, but uh, uh, there is this issue, and uh, the gaps in protection of, under humanitarian law for internal armed conflict, the, the basic weaknesses of Protocol 2. Uh, we're in a moment of reflective pause now, which I think is good. Uh, there was a lot of concern among uh, <coughs> non-governmental actors that the undertaking not result in the weakening of the distinctive features of each set of norms. There's also, I think, great skepticism that one could move uh, towards enacting a new set of norms, either a soft law or eventually towards hard law, without fundamentally weakening what's already there just through the process of political negotiation. So we're sort of in a pause area, and I think that, that uh, uh, you will, will be waiting to see where the formal standard setting goes, but in the meantime, um, these areas of convergence are going to work out uh, of themselves, I think, through jurisprudence a great deal and, and reveal to us exactly how big the gray zone is. Uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll be there. Thank you. i largely on my experience of four years in post-conflict Bosnia. I work on, on the subject of, of international humanitarian law, international human rights law for the first time seven years ago. And I found it interesting to look back at, at the article I wrote then to see if it had any relevance, whether you're right or wrong, um, and what parts of it still held true today. Uh, it was interesting in that I think that, that if you look at some of the things that were written back then, there's a lot being written in the early 90s on these subjects, that uh, they expose some of the trends that, that we've heard talked about here, uh, but that there's still, fortunately or unfortunately, some, some truth in, in the distinctions that are made between the two bodies of law and their, and their uses. Uh, at the time, I was writing from, from an NGO perspective and trying to look at uh, the trend that was uh, underway at that point to, within human rights organizations and, and Dinah has evidenced the, the work that Human Rights Watch, of course, has done on this, to begin to use uh, more generally and more accurately, I think, the principles of international humanitarian law in our work. And at the time, there were a number of good reasons why that made sense to do, many of which hold, continue to hold true today. Of course, uh, as reporting organizations, we were looking very much to where treaties were applicable and where they had been ratified and signed. And of course, with the Geneva Convention's broad adherence, uh, they were useful tools from that perspective. They were also useful in, in terms of the degree of specificity that they gave us over human rights 
uh, law provisions, although that is one of the areas where I think the development of human rights law in the last 10 years has, has brought those things closer together. Um, as Diana said, something else that was often spoken about was the fact that the humanitarian law provisions um, are written to apply in emergency situations where, of course, human rights law allows derogation. But again, as Diana said, that's, that has to some extent um, proven to be uh, a distinction that does not have as much import as, it, as one might have thought. And then uh, finally, in terms of legal distinctions, distinctions, we in the NGO community were looking at the fact that the application of humanitarian laws uh, beyond governments to our opposition groups gave us an additional tool that we thought might be useful. Finally, and, and more practically, we were looking at the fact that international humanitarian law was something that we felt as if military and law enforcement officials might take more seriously and might give us a different, a different type and quality of lever to use it against them. As I said, in looking at how that has held out um, over the last decade, uh, I will focus a little bit on three sets of, sets of actors or players in this equation. The first being the enforcement mechanisms that have developed under both humanitarian law and human rights law in that period of time. Obviously, uh, the growth of implementation and enforcement mechanisms uh, has, has, that has occurred in the last decade has been substantial. Um, but there are clearly, of course, shortcomings in those enforcement mechanisms for both humanitarian law and human rights law. On the humanitarian law side, we've seen the development of the ad hoc tribunals with their incredibly useful uh, legal uh, decisions, but also an incredibly resource intense process that takes a great deal of time uh, and is very complex and requires substantial expertise. Within human rights law, of course, there have also been development of uh, additional enforcement mechanisms but those continue to have inadequacies in terms of their individual remedies and in terms of the amount of uh, delay and enforceability of, of ultimate decisions. As part of that, I think the other trend that we've seen within the development of enforcement mechanisms for human rights and humanitarian law has been a convergence, a movement towards more hybrid systems. And, and just within the last couple of years, there have been noticeable developments in this sense. And if you look at the dialogue that, that took place in this room directly before this about truth and reconciliation commissions and their relationship to justice processes and the extent to which they can be complementary, I think you, you enter into a whole new realm of what we can do with international humanitarian law and international human rights law. With that as introduction, I'd say some words on the taking a comparative analysis in Bosnia-Herzegovina asked how international human, humanitarian law and international human rights law were used in very different and in, in this particular instance, I believe, complementary ways. If you look at within Bosnia to how enforcement of international humanitarian law has occurred uh, post-conflict uh, or during conflict in, the, in, in some instances, the, obviously, the, the key fact is the creation of the uh, International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, it's record, I think, without getting into a subject that's been dealt with uh, earlier at, at this forum, um, is, is a mixed story. Um, I'd point out three substantial shortcomings. Uh, one, the first being for those who had thought that the tribunal would have a substantial deterrent effect the, um, the facial evidence, at least, that given the indictments of uh, Karadzic and Mladic before Srebrenica, that that was not at least as good a deterrent as, as one might have hoped. Um, but I'd say secondly, uh, one of the, the other shortcomings has been the lack of a broader public impact or endorsement of the, of the tribunal process within the former Yugoslavia. And thirdly, the the cost of the prosecutions and that the uh, necessary uh, low level or, or uh, failure to reach down further into the body of potential uh, perpetrators because um, that, that goes along with that substantial cost. The figures uh, quoted to me most recently on this subject 
uh, looked at the fact that the tribunal would, by 2016, try 120 people and cost $2 billion. Uh, so, as I said, those are some of the shortcomings. But then secondly, of course, looking at the, the contribution that the tribunal has made, looking first, of course, that specifically at its impact on victims. Living in Bosnia post-conflict, it's fine to say, as I, as I did already, that it did not have what some had hoped in terms of a broader societal impact, but I do think it played a crucial role in providing a forum for victims to be able to, to seek recourse and for them to see that something was being done to address the suffering that they had undergone during the conflict. And most importantly, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the, the tribunal's strong record, I think, in development of law and its contribution to development now of, of further mechanisms for implementation of international humanitarian law. At the same time, of course, that the tribunal has been addressing uh, and applying international humanitarian law with regard to the former Yugoslav conflict, however, it's important to point out that there have been local prosecutions within Bosnia and Herzegovina um, for these very same crimes. The tribunal has primacy and, and can assert that in any given case, but it has chosen not to in a number of cases. I would point out that those local prosecutions have um, largely shown the inadequacy of a national state to effectively prosecute uh, in the direct wake of a conflict of war crimes such as these. Uh, the Bosnian system had uh, shortcomings both in terms of its ability and its willingness to, to handle this um, situation appropriately. Um, its ability in that the, uh, the perpetrators that they wanted to prosecute were often in the, in the wrong entity and they had no ability to actually apprehend them. They had little expertise. Many of the, the relevant people who wanted to prosecute these crimes had fled the country and they had few resources to be able to do it. On the other side, you also had a willingness problem. The independence of the judiciary of prosecutors was doubtful, and there were substantial political motives in, the, in terms of case selection within the Bosnian process. And you only need to look at the fact that within the entity of, of the Federation uh, under Bosnian and Croat control, the largest number of, of persons prosecuted were actually Bosniaks who were prosecuted by their fellow Bosniaks rather than any other um, group. So those mechanisms obviously had their shortcomings as well. At the same time, there was enforcement of human, human rights law occurring in Bosnia, looking in many instances at the exact same set of issues, the post-conflict issues. And in Bosnia, what they did was set up, of course, a separate human rights enforcement system that incorporated uh, the human broad range of human rights standards into Bosnian law and then created a human rights mechanism of the human rights chamber to try to address those. The, those uh, mechanisms encountered substantial problems in that they were slow to move, they were costly, but less costly than prosecutions. They too lacked public support, they were not understood by the population. Uh, these institutions were viewed as international institutions that didn't reach down into the population. And because of that, they have a substantial sustainability problem. It's not clear what will happen with the human rights mechanisms that were set up in Bosnia and whether or not they'll be able to continue post-conflict. But the role I would point out, since the topic here is the convergence of international humanitarian law and human rights law, was very distinct from the humanitarian law mechanisms I just mentioned. The human rights mechanisms, enforcement mechanisms, focused on some of the civil law issues that uh, arise in a conflict that were very important in a post-conflict setting, but that would never rise to, although they could theoretically, as violations of international humanitarian law have been considered by IPT, they would never have risen to the status that they would be considered by them. So, for example, the broadest category of cases handled by the Bosnian Human Rights Chamber was property law cases. Very important but not necessarily going to, going to uh, be prosecuted by either the local courts or the international tribunal. In looking at this, I, I wanted to draw two lessons learned in terms of how international humanitarian law and human rights law have interacted in a post-conflict setting. The first is that I think in both instances, 
uh, both in human rights law and humanitarian law mechanisms have found a need to bring themselves closer to the ground. And you see this very much in terms of the international humanitarian law enforcement mechanisms that are being considered for places like Sierra Leone. Um, the idea now in Sierra Leone is that there would be a special court that would have um, a national and international component and that that system would in some respects be made complementary to a truth and reconciliation commission process. That would allow these systems together to get past this problem, which I pointed out, of the lack of true impact and, and um, understanding within the population about how either international humanitarian law or international human rights law can respond to their problems. The second lesson learned, I would say, is that um, these, the situation in, in post-conflict Bosnia raises a substantial question about how one deals with the judicial system that is required post-conflict to look both at ongoing human rights violations and the uh, question of how to try cases arising from the conflict. And the fact that those cases would require the development of a substantial set of expertise would take many years to prosecute and may ultimately not mean that the judiciary is properly trained to do the, the ongoing day-to-day -day tasks that they have in terms of, of continuing to enforce the laws in a, in a, in a post-conflict society as opposed to dealing with the, the crimes of war. So in any setting right now, I think one of the key questions is how do we balance the need to create a judicial system in a post-conflict society that can handle international humanitarian law without devoting so many resources to make it sufficient to do that that we take away from our ability to create a system that for, uh, that is able to protect and promote human rights and, and enforce normative laws in a, in a more substantial way. The two other actors I've mentioned briefly, and I, I think I'm probably going on uh, a ways too long as well. I wanted to say a word about how NGOs view international humanitarian law and international human rights law now, setting aside the international organization role of, work of the ICRC and the UN. I think, um, as, as, as has already been shown, um, international NGOs have learned to use humanitarian law, and you don't need to look to the, the substantial work that Human Rights Watch did with regards to the NATO air campaign um, in, in Serbia to, to see that. I don't think that, that has actually been brought down to a local level very effectively, and I think that one of the issues that needs to be looked at is the ability of local NGOs to engage effectively on both international and humanitarian law issues and human rights issues, and to develop the different set of skills that are necessary to do that. Uh, Dinah's very erudite analysis shows the, the very difficult and complex legal issues that are involved in trying to apply humanitarian law, and I think it's very difficult many times for the local NGOs who are some of the most important voices in the midst of a conflict to be able to undertake that sort of analysis and to effectively apply it to their own conditions. Finally, I'd say a word, and it's interesting that um, having prepared recently uh, and simultaneously, I think Diane and I both ended up at, at a similar website. Um, I, I too think that one of the key issues, and, and speaking in a bar association room to a room that I'm sure is, is packed uh, full of lawyers, I think we get very caught up in looking at the concepts of international humanitarian law and international human rights law in a way that ignores what these concepts mean and their impact on, let me use the word, consumers um, of, of these concepts at, at both at the ground level, both combatants and potential victims. And I think it's very important to look at how both sets of law can help us to get the right messages across to the right people for the right reasons. In other words, how can they deter abuses and how can they provide protection for victims? And I think it is very clear that in both of these areas there have been substantial developments. In human rights law, it's clear to me that there is widespread acceptance and use of human rights language, but there isn't necessarily widespread understanding of what those concepts mean. As Dinah pointed out, with regards to humanitarian law, you, the same thing can be said. 
uh, the same studies that, that she referred to point to the fact that only one in four of those surveyed had a clear understanding in any way of what the Geneva Conventions um, were, and that even despite that, a large minority allowed um, the possibility of attacks on civilians, although they thought you should avoid them as much as possible. And the percentages of people who, despite their knowledge of, of the Geneva Conventions, would allow that are, are fairly startling. Um, it was in, in across the board between a quarter and a third. Uh, but interestingly, they did a parallel. That was in war-torn countries. They did a parallel look at the United States and found that it was about 42%. And if you look today at what's going on in, in, in Israel and Palestine, it, the percentages there were 58% of Israelis and 43% of Palestinians who would allow for some attacks on civilians. So with those words, I, I just close and then say that sometimes I think it would make sense if we started at the bottom and worked up. The final speaker of the Anthony Long Conference, try to be very brief. I was asked to provide a very broad brush stroke um, an assessment of the sort of pros and cons of the convergence, the trends that all of the other panelists have spoken about. Um, and I will do so, as I said, as briefly as possible. As I thought about this, I realized that um, my sense was that overall the positive trends had to related to the convergence of human rights and humanitarian law, which the last two panelists spoke about in particular. Some of my concerns about the convergence relate to um, the addition of the third area, international criminal law. So let me just quickly um, explain what I mean. In terms of the positive results of convergence, um, the, what I think one of the most positive uh, results of the convergence that several panelists have spoken about is simply that we are moving to an area of greater consistency, potentially among areas of law that each have been distinct, but which sometimes regulate precisely the same conduct. Obviously, it's better that being the case, that they all regulate the same conduct, but they do it in consistent and coherent uh, ways instead of in patchwork of conflicting, um, or at least distinct obligations on them bewildered subjects. Um, my principal concerns, as I said, uh, relate to the development of the increasing criminalization of certain human rights and uh, humanitarian law uh, violations. And um, I, I'll come back to that, but in, in brief, uh, my concern is that I have a, a technical problem. Sorry, is this better? That ought to do it. Um, my principal concern is that we need to keep the distinction between conduct that is uh, a violation of human rights but not criminal, and also between conduct that is criminal but ought to be punished um, in, in, back in the country where crimes occurred and really don't belong in an international court. So let me just quickly um, give a couple of examples of uh, positive trends, the kind of conversion that I think makes eminent sense. Um, and I'll do so by citing two decisions by international bodies that I think capture some of the benefits of this convergence. Um, one of the decisions is the decision that Michael Scharf referred to earlier, it's, um, it, but I'm going to focus on a different aspect. He referred to a decision by the American Commission of three years ago uh, involving an uprising that lasted 30 hours at La Tabla, the La Tablada barracks in Argentina. <coughs> and in that case, the Inter-American Commission, which is a human rights body, it's a human rights treaty body, um, interpreting a human rights convention and declaration, uh, ended up applying international humanitarian law. And now, how is this possible? How does a human rights body end up interpreting in a very sophisticated way and in a path-breaking way, as Michael indicated, humanitarian law? Well, it gave a number of reasons, and I'll, I'll cite just one um, because I think it's, it's probably the most persuasive reason it gave for how it ended up doing this. Um, as it noted, um, the right to life, which is enshrined in the American Convention on Human Rights, as in all of the general human rights conventions, applies in time of war as well as in time of peace. But it's, a, it's framed in very general terms. Now, what do you do when you have a situation where there is an internal armed conflict um, and uh, there's an allegation that the right to life has been violated? Um, the, what the Commission said is, well, we can't 
reach that determination unless we know whether the people who were killed by military forces were killed legitimately. And here we've got to have recourse to the more detailed, more particular provisions of the laws of war. Either they were legitimate combatants or they weren't, etc. And so what the commission did, and the most compelling reason for getting into this area was that it could not responsibly interpret a human rights convention without recourse to the laws of war. Um, <coughs> I, I want to say that this area has gotten complicated in subsequent decisions. I won't get into that now, um, but I think that this particular approach remains sound and actually makes eminent good sense. Um, the second decision I'd like to mention is this decision that I think is probably one of the most important, perhaps the most important judicial decision in humanitarian law since the Nuremberg decision, and that was the decision of the Appeals Chamber of the Yugoslavia Tribunal five years ago in the first case before the tribunal, that of Dusan Tadic. Uh, the decision I'm referring to, and the part of it I'm referring to, um, recognized that some violations of the laws of war that apply in internal armed conflicts are international crimes. Now, before the appeals chamber said so, um, many prominent legal scholars had doubted whether violations of the laws of war that govern solely internal armed conflicts could be international crimes. So this is a very important um, clarification of, of the law. The, what interests me here is the way the appeals chamber explained its reasoning. And, and it traced developments in state practice over the last, well, since the 1930s, basically. And, and talked about how uh, there had been a gradual change from a, an earlier period in international law that extensively regulated wars between states, but largely looked the other way when there was an internal armed conflict. And what, what the appeals chambers reasoned out loud was that uh, this stark dichotomy that long characterized the laws of war reflected the basic orientation of international law more generally which was, as it put it, uh, a state sovereignty approach. When states uh, go to war with each other, we'll try to enact as many protections as we can of our own soldiers, and we'll make it a reciprocal protection. But if they go to war against their own people, that's their business. Uh, we want them to look the other way when, when we uh, respond to our internal conflicts, and we will look the other way. And what the trial chamber said is, okay, that's the traditional view, but the world has changed enormously, and it's changed in ways um, that friends very eloquently chronicle for us. What it said is, principally as a result of, um, and this is one of the reasons that I view, but it said, principally as a result of developments in human rights law uh, in the past half century, this stark dichotomy couldn't persist. It doesn't make sense. International law has moved quite profoundly away from that state sovereignty oriented approach to what it called, I think, a human being oriented approach, something to that effect. And it said, in light of that broader development, of course it was the inevitable that international law could no longer turn a blind eye when states committed unspeakable crimes against uh, their own people. Now, I like this opinion because of the way it explains the phenomenon rather than because of the, or, as well as because of the result it creates. But it's just really for the first um, reason that I cited here. <laughs> now, I think those are good examples of why the convergence that has taken place makes sense and when it makes sense for these laws to come together. I'd like now, finally, to turn to the areas where I have some concerns. And as I intimated earlier, my principal concern uh, relates to adding the, the third area of law into this equation, which is international criminal law. Um, and in brief, my principal concern relates to how we think about the province of international courts. We're now at a time, living at a time, when the prospect of enforcement by international tribunals is far more viable than ever before. Uh, I, mentioned to Michael Scharf a little while ago that the first time I ever met him or Ben Ferenc was on a panel, the three of us were on, I think it could have only been five years ago, about an international criminal court. And I had the sense then that we were, forgive me Ben, but you know, angels dancing on the head of a pen at that point talking about the creation of an international criminal court. It seems so idealistic and so unrealistic 
And in a very short time, um, the statute for a tribunal of that kind has been drafted, adopted overwhelmingly. We have two ad hoc tribunals operating, mixed tribunals in the process of being created for the early in California. It's real. The prospect is real. Um, and in light of that, there is, I think, a risk. And I think the risk is that um, we need to be careful not to blur the distinctions between these different areas of law. And as I suggested earlier, we have to be particularly careful <coughs> to remember that not all human rights violations are crimes. And not all crimes that happen to be human, you know, human rights abuses ought to be prosecuted before an international court. And some of you are probably saying, well, yeah, duh, obvious, of course. Um, but but I, I guess I, I should say, I think there is often a tendency, uh, now that we're in a new era of enforcement, to push this um, trend as far as possible, to expand the number of uh, violations of humanitarian law and human rights violations that can be criminally prosecuted across borders by international tribunals. Let me give just one example of the kind of risk I have in mind, because it's not hypothetical. <coughs> the laws of war, as some of you know and many of you may not know, cover, provide quite extensive protections in many respects, which is, of course, as it should be. Um, but when those violations are all potentially subject to prosecution before an international tribunal, we have the risk that a court that is set up literally as the court of humanity, speaking on, on behalf of the international community, may end up using its very precious resources to hear charges on the order of the kind that were pressed against one. This is one example, a defendant, Slotko Alexovsky, who was tried before the Yugoslavia Tribunal. Among the charges um, that consumed considerable time at his hearing were charges, serious charges. All right, I want to be clear, serious charges. Um, but they involved inhumane detention conditions, inadequate numbers of blankets, particularly at the beginning of the detention period, prisoners had to share blankets, inadequate beds, overcrowding, all deplorable to be sure. Um, but should an international tribunal be uh, spending its finite time and resources on charges of that order? Um, and, and I want to say that the trial chamber itself made it clear its discomfort um, with, with that. Um, in contrast, and, and I'm going to read something that's disturbing, but I think it's important for us to remember what it is, after all, uh, these tribunals are set up for. And I'm going to read um, a few lines from a book review that's going to appear in tomorrow's New York Times. It's a review by Chuck uh, Sudetich, who used to cover the Bosnian conflict for the New York Times of a couple of books um, on war crimes tribunals. And he says, and this is disturbing, but I think it's important for us to remember what these tribunals are set up to do. He says, um, he, he sets this up and, and says, here's the dilemma. How do we understand the importance of war crimes tribunals? And then he disturbs us and he says, so imagine, and he's talking about real events. So imagine a gang of soldiers shooting a young woman in the head, nailing her hand and foot to a four by eight and setting her adrift on a river. Picture bullets puncturing the chests of bound prisoners and listen for the gurgle of their last breaths. Smell the corpses of chemical weapons and gas chamber victims. Hear the bleeding of a skinned man whose tongue has been cut out. See the ooze from the bodies of children run over by tanks. Now multiply these horrors a thousandfold and a thousandfold again. And alas, we have all lived through a period quite recently where crimes on that order happened over and over again on a mass scale. That is why we need international tribunals, and I think it's terribly important now that we enter into a new period of enforcement that, remem that we remember how important their job is and, and that we allow them to do their job. And at the same time, keep the pressure on governments to do their job, which is to provide the daily practice of justice a chance, uh, a, a, a serious prospect of victims of other human rights violations to find justice and protection in their own national courts. Thank you to, to all on this panel. Um, we have not quite five minutes left for questions, but before that, uh, I have a couple of announcements. One, you're all warmly invited to come to the reception that will be just out in the hall immediately after this session. 
um, and all the, the conversations and questions that I know are open in my mind and I hope we can continue uh, and share there. Secondly, there are two people who I hope you will join me in giving terrific thanks to. The first is Kelly Askin, who organized this weekend, as she did the one the year before, and if I'm correct, maybe the, the year before that, I'm not sure, but who's done a spectacular job in bringing together these panels and asking so many provocative questions. So thank you. Professor Al Rubin, but, but couldn't find him. Um, because I hope even in his absence, you'll, thank, you'll join me in thanking him. Uh, this is the end of his 10th uh, year in, in the position of uh, President of the American Branch of the ALA uh, in, in sponsoring these weekends. Um, and his you know, graciousness and, and generosity in lending his ideas um, and really inspiring this group, I think, deserve all of our thanks. So. Now for some questions. Please go up the mic. Thank you. And, and please identify yourself. Hi. Uh, my question is uh, really... Could you, could you identify yourself? Yes, my name is Dan Derby. I teach at Turo Law School. Uh, I'm responding to Michael Sharp's uh, uh, point, which uh, I wish he were here for. Uh, I think there may be some mischief at work in uh, the way that he posed it. Uh, I think the easiest way to look at it is that uh, he's uh, sort of creating a logical puzzle involving uh, assuming that a, a converse is going to be true. That is, if uh, the international community agrees that terrorist conduct in the nature of war crimes is bad, does that mean that the international community agrees that as so long as it doesn't amount to a war crime, it's good? And uh, I don't think that it plays out that way when you think about it. Rather, the idea is that uh, when the conduct is so awful that it is analogous to a war crime, then we should all cooperate in punishing it. Uh, but that then leads to the question of, well, what well, about the conduct that does not uh, so closely uh, resemble a war crime? And in that, the general rule is that each nation is on its own. Uh, there's no cooperation. Uh, so it helps, I think, to remember everybody agrees espionage is bad, but no one punishes their own spies. I suppose if I could be allowed, the, the, the chair's project of just responding a little bit is, it's yes, but the question still remains under what body of law we might punish it. Um, and that's where it, there is a, a lot of devil and a lot of details, uh, which I think is, is, is what Michael's point was. But thank you. Hi, I'm Paul Levi. I'd like to particularly address my remarks to uh, Professor Ferenz, but if anyone else can do it too. I'm, I also was in World War II, and I could not believe the 1990s. I just thought that the lessons had been learned and it just boggled my mind to, to see what was going on. And uh, in, in that sense, I almost think that malpractice law and divorce law should be also have been discussed here. Because divorce law requires you to have a, an agreement before you get a separation. And malpractice laws involving well, almost a collusion of the international community. It almost seems that judges have dirty hands in the sense of they attacked the sovereignty of Yugoslavia. It seemed to me unilaterally the sovereignty of Yugoslavia was abolished. No one said, let's have a peace conference to have a negotiated secession, because unnegotiated secessions always lead to civil war. And that, in one sense, self-determination always involves violation of human rights unless they're protected in the self-determination process. You could see in East Timor, and, and in Yugoslavia, what is going on. Now, in, in that sense, it seems to me that it's something that the international community wants to have amnesia about. Professor Ferenz has described what happened in the beginning of the century when no one, the diplomatic community, said hands off. I don't see how they could have not had 
a peace conference for a, a negotiated settlement of the Yugoslavia situation before it happened. I, I wanted to ask particular friends particularly, did the, New, did the Nuremberg trials and that those, all those trials handle the fact that historians say more than 500,000 Serbs were killed in concentration camps by Croats in the 1940s. And that obviously Serbia was interested that under the borders that the international community said was going to be Croatia, there were many Serbs still living. Uh, let me answer your question. It's a very interesting question. The answer to your question is a clear one. Uh, as every prosecutor knows, there are all kinds of crimes committed in the world, but uh, the problem of prosecutor is to prove that these defendants are guilty of specific crimes. The defendants who are tried at Nuremberg were not charged with those particular crimes, as horrendous as they were, and uh, we had enough work to do to get the evidence of the crime for which they were accused. However, you're raising a more important and fundamental point, I believe, and that is that we are witnessing an evolution in human society toward a more rational world order under law. It's a slow process, and it's imperfect, as we've seen the illustrations of the difficulties which are taking place in creating a new tribunals, in inventing new tribunals, and it's like a newborn infant. It's doesn't move, it can't walk, it messes itself up. It's got to be picked up, it's got to be cleaned, it's got to be helped, it's got to be encouraged. And if you do that, one day it will run, and it will run, I hope, in the right direction. But all of these minor defects, relatively minor, the total picture are real, they're unfortunate, um, but as long as we are moving in the right direction, I think there's no reason to be pessimistic. Well, but the Serb war, the Serb war criminals, say, because of what you said about Nuremberg, the Serb war criminals say, now we will settle the 1940 crimes. And they took it into their own hands. And yet while the world community would not see that this was inevitably going to occur, I can't understand it. The presence of courts may help people from, and deter them from seeking vengeance, because the courts are designed to create a rule of law and justice to correct past expense, uh, excesses. We see that Pinochet was detained in, in England. Whether he would be convicted, that would be difficult under the present circumstances, but it's a demonstration that we are moving in the right direction. So these injustices which exist throughout the world are unfortunate, but uh, we are dealing with them as best we can. Th thank you for those questions, sir, because I think they demonstrate exactly the, the underlying point of, of why we've been talking about these issues. So thank you all, and let's continue with the reception. It is not. You're on. There, there was a couple of things I was listening to, and one thing that I noticed is that... Speak up, Ronnie, because I'm not getting you. You had not just details, but you had a story that was attached to the details, and it makes history so sort of come up. Yes. And I like history. Well, I like history too, even though it's uh, some of the events of history are not exactly happy events. But I appreciate the fact that history is a story. It's a story of human suffering, it's a story of human endeavor, trying to make the world a better place. That's what I'm trying to do too. Okay, and I was looking at the timeline that you were talking about at the beginning. Um, well, just sort of starting with the, um, the League of Nations yes. and how it started off trying to bring world peace and bring a, um, a solution to problems. And, and I wasn't aware of the, um, until you were talking, I wasn't aware of the internal things that the countries were doing and what was behind it. But they had an idea for this. Yes, the women particularly uh, were determined to create a more peaceful world. And uh, that was reflected in the attempts to create the League of Nations and then the United Nations and the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for which uh, René Cassin, the principal author, together with Mrs. Roosevelt, won a Nobel Prize. That was seeking to create a world in which all human beings, regardless of their race or color, political persuasion, could live in peace and human dignity. That has been, in fact, the goal of my life. And, uh, what a part of okay, the other thing, too, um, you had ma mentioned toward the end that this was like a new infant? Yes. Okay. It's a new infant because it's complicated to make a a rational legal order which will be acceptable to everyone. 
uh, the disparity in the standards of education, for example, as well as economics, uh, makes it very difficult for all people to agree. But in fact, it's one small plan. And we've got to learn that we are all members of one human family. We've got to share the resources of this world in such a way that everyone can live as a decent human being. And that can be done. I'm convinced that it can be done. But it'll take a while. Uh, with our new technology, with the media, particularly with the television and with film, uh, people will recognize that. As they recognize it, they'll be willing to make the changes which are necessary to bring it about. Okay, now, in your lifetime, do you see this coming about? No, in my lifetime, no. Uh, I am over 80 years of age now, and these things don't move that quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, the time of one human life is only a blink in the eye of time. One can't expect to see vast changes in the way people think and the way they act and the new institutions that you need in such a short period of time. It may take another 100 years, maybe 200, but it's moving faster now than ever before because of the technology. So I'm hopeful that perhaps in your lifetime, or your children, or your grandchildren, they won't have to endure what I have endured. Okay, so again, what you're saying is that we have to have one world government or one world way of solving problems for there to be peace because of the way everything is now? Or? People don't like the word one world. It frightens them. Uh, I prefer to say that there are certain important problems which are global in nature and they can only be solved globally. For example, the use of television and radio and airplane landings and things of that kind. If people want to have their own customs and want to cherish their own traditions, that's fine. Provided they don't do it at the expense of the lives of other people, which is often the case. People are more willing to give up their lives than their hatreds, and that's unfortunate. So I don't like to talk about one government. There must be one principle that there is one human family, and they are entitled to the resources on this planet uh, to be shared in some rational and decent way. So, okay, if I'm hearing right, what we need is one universal set of laws that all governments can use. On fundamental principles, yes. Okay. Uh, and we are moving in that direction. Well, and we have them, but we don't have enforcement. We, we need clearer laws, we need courts to determine whether laws are violated, we need a system of effective enforcement. We began with it in the United Nations Charter, but that too had its contradiction, and nobody has honored the Charter. Where is the international military force that they called for? Where is the disarmament that it called for? Where is the social justice that it called for? None of these things have been created, and they've been more or less put into the background. That's unfortunate. We're going to have to resurrect them again before we have a better world. So where we're standing now is how do we enforce these principles? We have, do we have the principles? The principles are generally outlined, and they're in good principles. But we talked about having an international military force, for example. It's in the Charter. It was called for. It's been forgotten. Nobody talks about it. The United States becomes the policeman of the world. Nobody wants that. Uh, we should have, but you can't have a military approach until you have disarmament as well. You can't have nations having nuclear weapons and all the weapons of mass destruction they now have and expect to be able to control them. You couldn't do it in a national society. You certainly can't do it internationally. So we've got to do the things which people conceived of after the first world and the second world, but put them into practice. And we've never given it a chance. Okay. 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 Very good. How about Very good. That's that great. I'd, I'd like to say one thing. Can I have your wife just, just say one thing on Put camera? On there, right. Because you've <laughs> been the one who's been the supporter right. of... Right. Uh, I'm the good. power behind the camera. Give me a handbag. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Okay, okay. Okay, that's you know good. You know what they say, behind, behind every, every good man, man is a good woman. woman right? <laughs> that's okay. Right. All right. Okay, say very good. Say something brilliant for the camera. Do you have any grandchildren? Yes, three. Okay. We have four children and only three grandchildren. <laughs> we want to have a peaceful world for them. Yes. I, I feel that public education has been left out by everybody who's talking only law and enforcement. We have to educate for becoming more humane human beings. And I, as an educator, believe that very strongly, but we're not working on that. Nobody mentions it. I'd like somebody to pick up on that. <laughs> All right. Okay, very good.